Can you hear me? Excellent. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm Angeliki. I work at DeepMind. And uh, I was tasked uh, with uh, talking about the large language models. So I will try to deliver. Okay, uh, large language models are uh, great. Um, there has been uh, a lot of work recently. I mean, we actually see exponential um, advances in the field and um, yeah, I don't know what could I say about large language models. They they are fascinating. They um, the, the 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 performance that we see recently is really great. Um, we can do a lot of things. We can put them in our applications, for example, for chatbots. We can have collaborative writing assistants. Um, there is also a book that says to give some ideas about how to put GPT-3 uh, for products, a lot of things. So, so problem solved, right? No, this is where I would say the interesting questions start. Um, and uh, some of the research avenues, open questions that I would like to discuss here with you today is around the importance of data synthetic data generation, data expiration and keeping models up to date, and prompting. And I'll, I won't go too deep into all these topics, but the, the purpose of this talk would be to, to give a flavor across what I think are among the most exciting um, research directions. And uh, it would be nice to do this interactive, so if people have questions um, you know, please fire, like raise your hand and um, and ask questions, basically. Um, oh, okay. So um, we are witnessing a new era of of large models. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, this new era was powered by by GPT two in two thousand nineteen. And the, there, the largest model, I think, was around 1.5 billion. And by the way, I'm plotting here time on x-axis and number of parameters on, on y-axis. Um, GPT-2 was OK, I, I think. It was OK. Uh, not everybody blinked when it came out, but it, it, it was like an interesting um, advancement in the field. However, a year later, uh, GPT-3 came, um, and T5, but GPT-3 in this context. Um, and that was like, you know, now you're talking. Um, the model was bigger, it could do a lot of things, it would master a lot of tasks just through few short prompting and, you know, all sorts of different tasks. Uh, and I don't know who of you has Twitter here, but on Twitter, I think it was a period where every day people would post about all the things that uh, they figured out how to do with them through the uh, OpenAI demo. Okay, and we, uh, so 2020, um, and we saw that the, the number of parameters started to growing slowly. So we were from 1.5 billion to uh, encoder decoder models at 11 billion and 175 billion parameter models. And um, by reading through the research, um, do I need to do something with that? Um, by, uh, oh, okay, next time I can do this on my own. Uh, few shot learning, few shot learning. Um, so by reading through the research, um, it became clear that, you know, reading through the scaling loss paper of Kaplan and Tal, uh, it seemed that the more the models were getting big, big, the better performance we were getting. And the scaling loss paper was actually pretty clear on the messages that were passing. Um, they were quote unquote saying that the current bottleneck of, of models is uh, better hardware, allowing us uh, to achieve uh, model and data parallelism because big models may be the more important thing 
than big data. So in the studies that they were doing, um, I think that the right one is perhaps the, the most digestible, uh, they would find that if one had more compute to spend, then most of that more new compute should actually go towards uh, increasing the, the model size. Uh, and then the rest of the compute maybe, you know, of like going, uh, in increasing the data. But it was mainly about making uh, models bigger. And so people in the community, you know, really internalized uh, that message. And we saw in uh, 2021, the models, you know, exploding in size. 178, 280 billion, 530 billion. Uh, you know, the sky is your limit, so to speak. Um, so from here, we see a clear trend that, you know, we should make our models bigger, right? Because uh, that's what it seems to be happening. However, uh, recently, uh, there was an outlier um, on the graph. Uh, and that was the chinchilla model that went down all the way from the many billions to the 70 billion. Just to say, I'm not uh, delusional. 70 billion is still a large language model, right? Uh, but it's not as large as, you know, half a trillion. Um, but it's still like a very large. Okay, but... What was the deal? Like, why, why did people at DeepMind decide to scale down to 70 billion? Like, how did they do that? So the, the Chinchilla model offered an interesting plot twist to the story. And by, um, by um, adopting an experimental, a, a rigorous experimental setup, they actually found that training data and model size should be scaled at the same rate. So it's not anymore that if you want to get a better model, you should, you know, start scaling the model. But these two things should happen at the same time, giving basically a lot of importance uh, on, on having more data. But digesting a bit the implications of the, of the Chinchilla paper, um, it's, it means basically that most language models, the, the, the biggest basically language models out there today, um, have been, uh, were basically being undertrained in the sense they were basically trained on smaller data than they should optimally be trained. And this is, um, I'm having, I'm plotting here, uh, from the Chinchilla paper different language models, the number of parameters, and then the number of training tokens. And you can see that as people started making the models bigger, for example, the, um, the, the NLG 530 billion model, uh, it was trained on almost the same number of training tokens as GPT-3, despite the fact that it was roughly three times uh, bigger. On the other hand, the Chinchilla paper scaled down the, the parameter size uh, by, however, um, increasing quite drastically the, the, the training data size. So it went from to have 270 billion to 1.4 trillion data. So, and, and it's not just, you know, it just became smaller, it's also, you know, became a better, better language model. Um, this is just some exam some results from the paper. So, so if we take a minute and um, if we take a minute and we think about that result, uh, what it says basically is that the bottleneck is not the bottleneck of getting better and powerful language models is not. The harder, it is not a hardware bottleneck. It's not about increasing the, the, the number of parameters. Um, the bottleneck is actually um, getting more data and getting more and, and high quality data. Um, and I would even spin it a bit more and say that having access to more data 
um, becomes even more important if we wish to further scale down um, our models and make them even smaller. Um, if people are interested on more around the implications of, of this topic, um, I linked here a blog post that presents a very nice um, overview of, uh, of some of these um, implications. Okay, so we need more data. Yes. Yeah, so so the question is a uh, um the question was um that the, the Chinchilla recommendation paper says that if we uh, we need to be scaling data and models at the same rate, but why Chinchilla scaled down models but scaled up um, data? The that would hold. Um, so th basically, Chinchilla changed uh, the, the the scaling parameters. So for the it's not, it's not that we have the previous scaling parameters and then, you know, we go down three times, but we go up two times. It's, it's new scaling param it's a, it's a new scaling law, which is here on the left. And so based on these scaling laws, uh, they, they have this recommendation, which means that if I want to have, let's say a chinchilla model that is, uh, like the, I don't know, the next chinchilla model that is better, then basically, I don't know if, if I articulated the answer right, but it's not with respect, like they, they went up and down with respect to the previous scaling law, but this is like a different, it's a different in interpretation, it's, it's a different equation basically. And based on this equation, it's the 50-50. Okay. So now basically this means that the, um, data becomes really important and the question is you know how and where can we find all this data uh, and of course we can start thinking about all the available you know data and benchmarks on the web and i have here a collection but uh the the, impl the implications of chinchilla paper might make us think that uh potentially we might start to uh, be a bit creative with the way that, that we get our data and potentially creative data generation might be a promising avenue here. Um, to note that create um, data generation might actually be a good moment to, to tackle today, especially as our, our models get better, um, we can hope basically to have better generated data. So, um, now I'll, I'll like to discuss briefly two case studies uh, of people that have tried of two case studies that attempted to to create um, data for for training models. The, in the first case study, uh, uh, the authors of the the papers that I'll discuss they wanted to um, to work on QA, and they. The, the task was to generate a question answer pairs. So in the first study, um, I will be talking about the paper by Lewis and colleagues, uh, the probably asked questions. And in their study, they start from a corpus. Let's say they start from Wikipedia. And what they really want is they want to create, you know, more and more questions and answers that are grounded on, on the Wikipedia corpus. So the way they go about this, they start with, with a corpus, the Wikipedia, and then they try to identify paragraphs in Wikipedia uh, that might lend themselves, um, that are basically pas passages for which people might ask, for example, a question. So they try to identify basically good passages that could lend themselves nicely for generating questions. Um, now, given that we have uh, a passage, a paragraph, 
Uh, the second step is to try to identify an answer, to, to try to identify a phrase on this paragraph that could become a potential answer for the question to be generated. The second step is to then use the passage and the answer that has been extracted from the passage in order to generate the question. Um, and the way that this we could model that is basically we could model it as a supervised learning problem by using question answer data sets, but rather flipping the prediction problem and rather fitting a model, for example, a, a BART model or a T5 model, such that we take as input a, pa a paragraph and an answer, and then we try to generate um, the question. So basically, this is what they did. Uh, and by taking their question generation model, they can now, you know, roll it over on Wikipedia and start generating um, question and answer pairs. And the last step was to take all these question and answer pairs and then uh, filter, um, filter the pairs that they don't quite make sense or they're too noisy, um, et cetera, et cetera. So just some examples of the type of things that we can, um, we can generate, we, the, the authors can generate. Uh, we see that you know, most of the questions are, are pretty factual. Um, answers are mainly named entities and, and dates, so like basically named entities. Uh, and things seem to make sense, but occasionally, uh, because this is, these questions are created from, from um, not from an oracle model, but rather from, from a learned model, uh, oftentimes the, the model might, gen might generate questions that are not necessarily grounded on the context. And these are the last two examples where the questions don't quite make that much sense. Um, a, second, uh, a second now um, case study in this, in this vein of research is uh, followed by um, Liska, et al., Liska and colleagues in the streaming QA work, where the authors, they wanted to study um, adapting models uh, adapting models over time and the the it, and it wasn't the, there weren't available benchmarks for grounding questions into particular points in time and the authors again followed a similar uh, story where in this particular case they used a large language model few shot prompting uh, and then they generated question and answers across 15 years um, of news uh, and these are some of the questions that generated, like um, which cabinet minister has confirmed he has virus, or which team does Steve Jobs play for, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so uh, doing question generation is, is good, but uh, at the same time, there are some things that we need to have in mind, potential, I don't know, pitfalls. Uh, and the first thing here is that we need to consider the acceptable signal to noise ratio um, because we are automatically generating data there is a, a lingering concern that uh, the model might actually be, be generating non-factual questions with respect to a paragraph which are then further amplified by the models that are then trained on this data and a potential mitiga mitigation here that has been followed by, by this work is basically to overgenerate. So generate really, you know, millions and millions of questions and then do very careful and aggressive filtering over the questions, oftentimes uh, involving the use of, of human annotators to, to make sure that um, the quality is, is acceptable. Now, a second case study, uh, which is a spin of the first one, is um, trying to generate dialogues. Um, and this is uh, the work by Dia colleagues on dialogue and painting. And this particular application, um, it's, it's quite interesting 
um, because there are not that, like, it's not quite easy to get dialogue data sets to start with. Um, and it, it becomes particularly challenging when wanting to move from one domain to another where we might have, for example, a collection of documents, but we might not have dialogues that uh, talk about this, these documents. Um, the, the way the authors went about it is actually quite, quite interesting. So the intuition, the intuition that the authors followed was that given given a paragraph any paragraph out there um writers structure documents and their flow uh having some communicative intentions in mind uh in the sense that thinking you know what the audience questions might be and then uh trying to answer those so what this means is basically when we see a paragraph uh, then this paragraph is really a collection of answers to some questions Um, and then basically following on that, what the authors did was, uh, again, treating that into a supervised learning problem and then having the, the, the sentences from the paragraph as answers, but not, and now trying to generate uh, the questions with the spin that now the questions, they're not generated independently, but rather the, the supervised learning problem uh, in, um, involves generating questions in the context of, of the full dialogue. Um, now, again, some more uh, limitations because, or I don't know, possibilities for further research. Um, when doing a data generation for, uh, for question answering or dialogue, we always need to assume that we have access to some uh, seed corpus for fitting the generative model. So, for example, as in the case of the first paper, uh, we, we need to start with something with, with already a question answering data set so that we can fit uh, an answer to question uh, supervised model. So, an interesting question here is uh, whether the, the current approaches allow us to to extrapolate um, to extrapolate from that seed corpus so if if we use a seed corpus that has some topic and some structure and some format can we really apply automatic uh, data generation and on, on, on a different topic or you know to go from short questions to long questions or um, considerations of this sort and I guess the second interesting topic is whether uh, it's possible for us to control the type of data that are being generated. For example, can we control the questions, uh, whether the, the questions can be more reasoning, more reasoning heavy or um, more heavy tailed or more noisy? Because currently the methods that um, we've presented here, we've, we've discussed, uh, everything is controlled by the passage and the, and the, and the answer. So it, it, it's, it's interesting to start thinking about other um, nodes that we can turn when thinking about data generation. An interesting uh, follow-up question here is that this has been applied on, on, on the text modality. Uh, it will be interesting to think how uh, something like this could be spent, for example, for vision tasks. But and synthetic data generation would mean in that case, um, or for time series, could we even do that? Why not? Or for other tasks, and how? I don't have answers. I just have questions. Uh, but uh, I, it's it's a, it's an interesting. It, I don't know. I, I think it's an interesting topic, and potentially might allow us to um, to to be able to get more data for potentially other other type of domains where we might be struggling with the availability of, of good data. Last uh, but not least, when talking about both real but also generated data, um, it's it's good to have in mind that all data out there have an expiration date, um, in the sense that. The data that we use talk about a world 
And by definition, this world is, go is always going to be in the past uh, from the time we started talking about the world. It's a bit of a, of a, of a meta comment, but um, we, we constantly basically use models that have been trained on the past. Uh, and this um, is going to hit us at some point, and I th it, it, it's already hitting us uh, in many applications. So, yeah, basically, um, the world is constantly evolving, and uh, how the world is evolving is, is affecting our language models, our data and the language models, in, in slightly different ways. So, for example, grammar is one of those things that evolves pretty slowly. Uh, it takes centuries, for example, for a new syntactic construction to enter, um, to enter our discourse. So, we, we don't expect, you know, language models to struggle so much about that, because by the time that the new grammar will have evolved, we might have actually trained, you know, already the next generation of models. But if you look, for example, at lexicon, uh, we have new words entering our vocabulary very, very frequently. Uh, so words that are entering our vocabulary but are here to stay, so right, not just noise. For example, COVID is one of those words that was not in our vocabulary uh, two, three years ago. But currently, we tend to use this word, I would say, at least once every two days. De depending on where you are, I would say. Um, and knowledge, knowledge on the other hand, is something that changes, uh, you, know, e you know, sometimes even by the minute. Like, for example, when we talk about the price of a stock, the price of a Bitcoin, um, who is the, the prime minister in the UK, in Italy, uh, in Italy, anyway, uh, was... I didn't say a joke. I think you might have gotten the joke there. Um, but uh, yeah, basically knowledge changes over time. And one somewhat under, under unexplored type of change in language uh, has to do with the conventions and the social views that we have. Uh, and this is, there is a very nice discussion in the Stochastic Parrots paper by uh, Bender and colleagues. Um, basically, a lot, our, our society changes, and because the society changes, it also changes how we talk about the society and, and what do we talk about. To give an example borrowed by, by the authors of the um, Stochastic Parrots, uh, the, the, the discourse around the BLM um, movement, Black Lives Matter, um, has changed drastically from, from five years ago. And if our models are not trained on the right here, right now, they might actually have the wrong perception uh, of the society. So th that's just like one more, uh, one more reason why we should be making sure to, to keeping our models um, in sync with the world. Okay. Um, I have some news for you. Uh, static models are not fortune tellers. Uh, it doesn't matter, probably, with an asterisk, how big your model is. Um, it probably won't be able to predict the future. This is an excerpt from uh, a recent tweet from uh, uh, a hugging face uh, researcher, um, observing that uh, BERT and GPT-2 that have been trained three, four, three years ago, and, and yeah, um, has been downloaded already 30 million times. Um, but the models were trained when Obama was a president and uh, there was no COVID. Uh, and this means that now when we try to sample something about COVID from the GPT-2, GPT-2 lives in a parallel universe where COVID is a community of scientists working together on stuff which is a quite interesting spin to COVID, but not quite, uh, I would say, uh, grounded to reality. Um, we don't know that models are fortune tellers just by uh, reading Twitter. We've actually done some research about that. Um, and we found that x-axis is um, time, y-axis is um, 
relative perform relative perplexity increase so perplexity increase going up means that our model gets worse high perplexity is bad low perplexity is good it's one of these unintuitive things of perplexity um, what we found is models predictions degrade if we keep them stale and then we ask them to predict something about a month two months three months and if we go two years after the model was trained which is the situation of bird and cpt2 by now we see that especially with respect to knowledge intensive tokens we have almost 50 percent worse perplexity so um houston we have a problem i think it's a fair uh, uh summary so what do we do um first we need to um what's the word uh realize accept 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 acceptance is the first uh is the first state we need to accept that this is a problem and we also need to accept that time time passing by it, it does not affect all the tasks in the very same way so we cannot just lump everything together into a single benchmark and we have started seeing a lot of work in the community currently around studying these topics but this is you know this is just the beginning uh we've seen work on uh how time affects language modeling predictions question answering data sets especially the question answering data sets that are about like factual information um but an interesting question here to the multidisciplinary group is for example what happens with time and vision how how would new time uh, affect uh, vision benchmarks and what about your task have you thought about time and and your particular task what what would happen i mean it might be that nothing happens but um or what is the what is the speed of of um of change that becomes critical to having a good performance yeah these are just again you know some questions no answers um so okay time is important uh and it's good idea to probably start keeping the models up to date but uh, how do we go about and we do that so first things first it's fair to say that um keeping models up to date is a cool thing so to speak but it's a it's a very hard thing to do uh especially if one wants to do that at scale um why because as more data come in uh this very easily might become a very uh, infeasible thing to do uh depending on on on, on the approach so imagine let's say that I want to be retraining every day my model with the new data. This is not, you know, this is not possible. New data come in faster than the speed of me training a new model, especially if this is like, uh, you know, into the billions. Okay, so when we talk about keeping models up to date, it's important to think about the two, um, the two axes here, two axes of how much memory is required. I'll use memory to refer to the memory we need to store the data, the data that just come like as they come, and the compute required. And I would use compute to refer to the compute we need to spend to the model uh, for injecting the knowledge of the data that came into the model. Um, one thing that could be done um, that is Comp that is memory very intensive uh, but does not require that much compute is to use uh, retrieval models and retrieval models are the ones where um, do we know retrieval models okay somewhat um, so retrieval models are very it's like as a concept is um is a very clean concept uh, so retrieval models um, we have a generative model that can be a language model can be a seek to seek model a t5 you know put your own you know your favorite model 
in the in the uh, green box. Uh, retrieval models are the models that they don't just use information in the green box in the, in the model only, but also use information from uh, data that have been retrieved to facilitate the model uh, solving uh, the task at hand. So in this particular case, let's say that we are doing question answering. Where was Alan Turing born? Um, if if we would just do this with a, with a generative model, we would just ask this to the generative model, and the generative model would need to, I don't know, go into its weights and locate uh, the information about Alan Turing in its weights. I don't know, maybe Neuron32 talks about Alan Turing, and maybe from there on, um, answer the question that is made over London. Now, a retrieval model, what we do instead is that it would go to some corpus, let's say Wikipedia, it would find things that talk about Alan Turing, and then it would retrieve those and throw it into the input of the model. So now the model has like a much easier time answering the question because the information, apart from the neuron 32, is also in the input of the model. So it gets like, it's somewhat um, easier to do the task. Okay, retrieval models for this reason are um, compute, they don't require uh, too much compute to keep up to date because I don't need to change my model. Uh, however, they are very uh, memory intensive because uh, the, the, we need to be keeping all this data somewhere so that the retrieval model can have access to it and use them. Okay, one such retrieval model that has been quite successful recently is the uh, fusion in decoders by Isaacart and Grave. And um, uh, this model is applied on the topic of, uh, on the task of question answering. So here, basically, uh, we have a database of documents from Wikipedia, as I uh, gave the example before. And when the question comes, then uh, the authors use the question as a way to retrieve um, paragraphs from Wikipedia that are in the topic of the question. And there are many ways that one could do that retrieval. It could be done with TFIDF, it could be done with, um, but it also could be done with a dense models, where a dense models might be something like a bird, you know, something for which we have a vector, and then we could just do, for example, cosine similarity and retrieve th similar things. Okay, we retrieve things, and then for, e for the question, uh, then we, we have retrieved potential paragraphs that talk about the question. Um, the next thing, oh. So an interesting thing to note here is that if let's say I would want to apply this to a different domain or to have a different database with more data, more up-to-date data, all I would have to do would be to just change the database. And this is why this method is very compute efficient because it's just about swapping in and out data. Um, the next thing that the authors do is they separately encode um, the question and the passages. Uh, separately, so there is no interaction between uh, the different encodings. They concatenate all those things together, uh, and then they throw this into the decoder so that the decoder can then generate the answer. And the interesting thing here is that this is basically end-to-end -end propagatable. So if one has questions and answers, then they can have, they can train one of these models. Okay, so as I mentioned, the model doesn't require updates to be kept up to date, which is a plus. Um, as a, as a side, uh, side effect, um, such a model where we answer questions not just relying on the knowledge that the model has in its weights, but also on the extra evidence might help us to have, um, uh, to generate text that is more grounded to, to reality because the model now needs to have to, needs to look into the evidence to answer the question so we might get less hallucinations 
uh, on the on the on the on the negative on the yeah on the negative side um using retrieval modules to keep models updated means that we need to have a way to store all the data and data grow exponentially so at some point this will become infeasible and i think uh, for me the most interesting question here is what happens when um when the knowledge in the language model which is let's say let's take the question who is the current president of the united states uh, gpt2 was trained to believe that obama is the current president okay but if we do this retrieval based models we will retrieve things from wikipedia that say who is the current president <laughs> joe biden uh that would say joe biden was the the current is the current president and so we are in a very interesting situation where we need to generate an answer but our a billion parameter model says uh Obama. and the uh and the retrieval paragraph the retrieved paragraphs they say biden so there is a contradiction there uh and this is like an yeah, it's 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 an interesting consideration about how to go regarding these cases because um, yeah we have a problem of who to trust. Um, the second way of keeping models updated is uh, like the um, the most I would say natural way to do things uh, is the one where as new data come we just shove them into the model like we keep basically fine tuning models on new data. And this is actually very nice because we don't have this problem anymore of, you know, um, like the model thinking something else and the, the, the evidence thinking something else. Like now everything is in sync. Everybody thinks that the current president is uh, Biden. However, uh, there is a lot of redundancy found in text. So if we just keep fine tuning data blindly on everything we find on the web, we it's just like too much information basically and this means that um, this approach might be very memory uh, less memory uh, intensive because like after we push the knowledge into the model we can just throw away the document we just don't need to keep it anymore but it's very comp compute um, intense because we need to be doing uh, we need to be touching basically the parameters of the model the weights uh, and this is okay for small models, but when it's very challenging to do this as the parameters grow um, to the billions. But again, there are like some alternatives proposed, like for example, adapters where um, they might um, keep a better balance. It's something that I didn't add here, but uh, for example, the presentation that Luca gave um, like an hour ago, give or take, uh, about editing uh, editing neurons. That might be yet another approach to keep models updated, where you just locate which neuron stores the information, and then just manipulating that, changing that particular neuron, which an approach like this called editing editing models. Uh, would lie somewhere in between being compute or between compute and, uh, and memory requirements. So it might be an appealing approach to, to use. Okay, and um, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that the discourse around static models is, uh, is, is starting to, to change. Um, well, mod about static models and, and static data. And for example, this is a recent tweet by Hugging Face from uh, a month ago. Uh, and Hugging Face um, came to this, basically um, internalized this realization that model that users today use models that are not reflective of reality, and um, they are committing to uh, to start thinking and working on online language modeling. So it's it's a very exciting. Uh, it's a very exciting initiative and a lot of great research um, questions around the topic. 
Okay, uh, switching gears from data to prompting, there is, I won't try to retrofit a, a bridge there. It's, a, um, I don't know, prompting is, a, is, is one of those things that uh, it's, it's a bit of a, of a dark knowledge. Are we aware of prompting at all? Some hands? Some hands? Okay. So I'll try to... Uh, Okay, um, basically the, the story with prompting is that large language models could do a lot of things. Uh, so we can give, you know, a few examples and tell the model to do sentiment analysis, or we can give some examples and tell the model to do translation, or we can give some examples, you know, two, three examples, five, 20, 30, and ask the model to do question answering. However, and this is the catch, uh, the, the current models are actually very, very sensitive to the way things are presented to them in their input, which means that uh, if, we, if we, for example, introduce also textual description to the model about what it needs to do, or if we, the, the type of examples that we use to, to, con to convey to the model the task that it needs to, to solve, or even the order of examples in which we, we the, the order of examples that we present to the model to do a task. These are things that, you know, we, for us as humans, it wouldn't make a difference. Uh, like if I give you an example and then if I give you another example, like it doesn't quite matter which example I give first, like you'll still more or less um, understand what I'm saying. But language models are very sensitive to this uh, non-semantic uh, so to speak, uh, alter, uh, alternations in the input. And, and uh, this, is, uh, this is one study, the, the top picture, which I think you can barely see. Um, so this is a study where the authors were doing, um, what task is that? Subject accuracy. It's one task, we don't care what it is. It's some task. And they looked into um, the performance of GPT-2 and GPT-3 across different uh, parameter sizes. And all they did is um, they had four examples that they were presenting to the model. And all they were doing is just uh, having all the possible permutations of examples, so 24 permutations, and then reporting the performance of the model in all these 24 permutations. And we, what the authors plot here is that the mean average, the mean performance, but also the variance across the different permutations. And this is, uh, it's horrifying. I mean, um, for the 174 billion parameter model, one permutation might give, um, what is that, 85, but another permutation might give 55. So this is a, uh, it's it's a quite um, it's it's quite a difference. Um, now, like an interesting question here is: okay, um, models are sensitive to the input. Is this a bug, or is it a feature? Eh, I don't know. It's uh, I think the community is pretty. Uh, What's the word? Uh, torn, torn on that. Uh, it's it's definitely a bug in the sense that um, it shouldn't matter what example. Well, what example I give? Maybe you know there are good and bad examples, but the order of examples. It's one of the things that, like in the ideal world, you know, it shouldn't matter. Um, the fact that it does matter uh, points to to. Um, to challenges of the models, you know, with respect to overfitting or sensitivity or lack of robustness, uh, et cetera, et cetera. However, at the same time, it gives us a way to improve models uh, by basically being a bit more mindful around how we present things into the input, how we present things into the input of the model, but also how we interact with our models, trying to have them do um, things for us. 
And uh, again, the community has been uh, uh, has been, you know, trying to think about different ways to basically optimize uh, optimize all aspects or some aspects with respect to to prompting. And I point here to a recent uh, survey. Um, one thing. One thing that uh, is like, one, like if we want to think about, for example, improving the performance of models, improving the interactions that we have by by better prompts, one intuitive thing to do would be to um, to 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 find, you know, the, the type of better examples that can allow a model to to do a task uh, better. And let's say here that you know we have uh, the task of question answering where we want to have uh, GPT-3 answer a question, what country, what country is Frederick MD in? Sorry, what county? What county is Frederick MD in? So we could have random examples used to prompt the language model for to solve this task. However, uh, Liu and colleagues um Liu, Liu and colleagues uh intuition was that we can potentially try to use information about the test the test question that we want to get an answer to and try to find prompts that are more in line to this um test question so they formed this into uh, a retrieval task and they used k nearest neighbors as a way to to select uh, more fitting examples. So what the authors did is that they encoded all the possible examples that the model could have access to to do the task, and uh, used and then uh, used cosine similarity to retrieve uh, the more similar questions to the current test question. Uh, for example, in, in that particular example, uh, something that was used in the prompt was what county is the Luth, Minnesota in St. Louis County? And that could be one way to prompt the model uh, to do the task. Okay, but beyond uh, using, beyond optimizing what we put into the prompt, um, there are bigger questions with respect to, uh, to prompting and, and how we use uh, and how we use these models. So this is one example of uh, of uh, wanting to use one of these big models to do um, to do a arithmetic task. So uh, the task here, the the can you see the question? It's fine. I'm going to um, read it. So the question is: A juggler can juggle 16 balls. Half of the balls are golf balls and half of the golf balls are blue. How many blue golf balls are there? Uh, I don't know what the answer now to that. Maybe someone can tell me. Um, but uh, the model, if, in the, like if we would take this and throw it into the model, a very big model would say eight. Uh, and that's not a correct answer. OK. So uh, people started thinking a lot about uh, how would a human attempt to solve the task? Uh, like, what would the, the 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 thought process be to do that? It wouldn't just be a forward pass through our brain, right? We would we would probably, you know, try to break down the model, uh, and they tried to simulate that with a language model. So basically, just changing the prompting. No, no retraining, no fine tuning nothing required just how we present things to the model so in this particular work way uh, way and colleagues uh, they came up with this idea of chain of chain of thought prompting so uh, their their observation was instead of just presenting to the model examples of question and answers they would present to the model, not just question and answers, but rather, which is the green, the top, but rather all the thought process that a reasonable person would follow to, to answer uh, the question. For example, in the question, Roger has five tennis balls, he buys two more kinds of tennis balls, each can have 
three tennis balls. How many tennis balls do we have now? Does he have now? They would, um, they would furthermore prompt the model, add to the model an explanation that, oh, actually Roger started with five balls, two cans of three tennis balls, each has, has six balls, five plus six equals 11. The answer is, is 11. And by doing that, they now allow the model, they now teach the model the type of processing that it should follow. So not just say 42, but rather why the answer should be 42. Uh, this, is an, this is like a very good way to solve arithmetic tasks uh, because like this, this is one way that, for example, children in school solve these arithmetic tasks. They always have to come up with some explanation. Um, but it's also a reasonable way to go about solving more common sense reasoning tasks. For example, um, the, the top right, is the following sentence plausible? Joao Moutinho caught the screen pass in the NFC Championship. Then the, the prompting would be, Joao Moutinho is a soccer player, the NFC Championship is part of the American football, not soccer, so the answer is no. So that's pretty reasonable thing uh, to follow. And these are some results, but the, the, on, on, on that type of common sense reasoning. And the interesting thing here is that such a, mod, such, such a method do not just make big models better, but they also make even smaller models better, which is a, which is a very encouraging thing uh, if, if we wish to be able also to, to, to work with smaller models. Um, of course, there is always a next level, like something, you know, more, um, more wild. And subsequent uh, research found that, uh, that it's not actually necessary to put this, uh, this um, reasoning steps into the prompt of the model so that the model can copy from it. Uh, especially with the large models, all you need to say to the model is, okay, now let's think step by step. And, uh, uh, and that seems to then um, bring the model into a way of solving the task that, are, that, forces, that um, makes it basically to follow this type of, of reasoning. Uh, in one word, I feel this is cool. I mean, this is inherently cool. But as a researcher, I have no idea why this works. Uh, and this is extremely, um, I don't know what adjective to use. This is a bit unsettling. Uh, basically, models can do a number of interesting things, but our understanding of why some of these things work are, um, is not there. And would be great to have a bit more understanding why things work, because maybe we can then have a process of uh, finding those things with a bit less, you know, trial and error. Um, so, basically, I mean, I, I, what I've been talking about here is basically that language models can do many things, but at the same time, there are many, many of these things that they can't quite do on their own. Like, they might need a, a bit of a nudge. Uh, or for some things we might not even be, or even for some of the things we might not even need a language model to do it for us. Like maybe I don't need a language model to tell me how much four and four um, amounts to, because maybe something simpler like a calculator could, could give me that answer with like, you know, accuracy 100%. So an interesting research, an, an interesting avenue that we start now seeing with these models is that avenue of outsourcing some of the things that current models struggle with uh, in the same way that um, uh, we ourselves, we don't necessarily do every, and every task on our own. We always use some sort of tool. And uh, that tool, you know, might be either a calculator or, uh, or Google search. I mean, I think I've, the best code I write is usually by copy-pasting things from, um, from the web. Um, and it's, I would say, even the, the, the better way to write code because it's more uh, uh, error-free. But anyway, don't take coding uh, 
uh, tips from me. But um, we, like we, we as humans, we are able to do a number of things. And the reason why we are able to do a number of things is because we have access to a number of tools that amplify really our, our skills. So this is the type of um, this is the type of mentality that a lot of research, a lot of recent work uh, is following. Uh, perhaps one of the most widespread example recently is the one of trying to couple language models, large language models, with uh, with uh, an external search engine like Bing or Google or. I don't know what other search engine is there, but uh, it, it does like an, a search engine. Um, what? Ah, sorry, I thought there was some comments on the search engines. Okay, um, and uh, this is some. This is an example. Oh, yeah, and just to say briefly that um, the the reason why one would want to couple a language models with a search engine is because um, we might want to have access to up to date information without like all this consideration about, um, for example, keeping our own index, maintaining it, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is an example here uh, from the, the work of uh, Schuster et al, where um, they, have a, they, they are in the dialogue setting and they want to, to have an agent that responds sensibly to a user and they give to the agent access to the web and the the agent basically learns to form the query that should go to the web um, and then they are able to get back this information and then use one of these retrieval based models that we just talked before to mush everything together and give um, a grounded answer to the user that um, relies on retrieved evidence and there are like other types of tools that people are thinking like calculator google search google translate but um yeah the, these are a bit application specific about what's the right tool to enhance the the model with this is uh, something that i found on twitter today um it was posted today last night actually to be precise um but here Basically, uh, the, the, the author of this tweet, what they did is that uh, they used GPT-3 to, to write a piece of code that then would go to the Python interpreter and then the, they would get the answer back from the Python inter interpreter to have as an answer. So this is, you know, one more application of, uh, of combining GPT-3 with a Python uh, interpreter to be able to have potentially answers to more programmatic type of questions. Um, okay, just to start um, uh, wrapping up. Yeah, slowly, uh, language models, the, 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 the new era of large language models um, so a number of, of emerging capabilities in the sense that models today are able to do things that were not able to do in the past. And this is um, um, an, an, a, a summary plot from the work by Wei et al, uh, where the x-axis, well, different plots are different benchmarks. Uh, y axis is the performance, x axis is the, the model size. And uh, what they find is that for many, for, for a couple of benchmarks, the, the model stops being at random at the, at the high end of the parameter, uh, of the number of parameters. So they're basically talking about an emergent ability. So large language models basically uh, have some abilities that smaller models um, didn't have. Um, an, interesting, an interesting spin here, uh, here, yeah, an interesting spin here is that actually the, the, these models might even be more capable than, than we might think. Uh, also, if, if we take into account, also this is in the context, for example, of the prompting study that uh, we saw like a couple of minutes ago where a model was not able to do a task but by having this more 
thinking like process the model was actually able to do the task also like something that it's a fair thing to say is that uh, the, another reason why my, why we might think that current models are more capable is because the type of benchmarks that we have today in their vast majority were actually created when, when the smaller models were at random uh, for many capabilities. So what this means is that the, 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 the language models have, have come into a new era but the way that we evaluate the models and the benchmarks that we use have been there for quite some time now. So there is a bit of a, there is a slight disconnect there. And so um, it's not unthinkable that some of the capabilities that we, that we might care about might actually be already in the model. We just didn't have a way to find them. Like we just didn't come up with the right benchmark that um, that pro properly tests for that capability. An interesting observation here is that, uh, again, going back to Twitter, which is where I usually get my uh, my research updates. Um, I also read archive, by the way. That was a joke. Uh, I don't just read Twitter. Um, is the, the type of Twitter evaluation that we see where people, they get access to GPT-3 or any other um, performant language model and they play with it. And then they have, they put on the Twitter, oh, I can, uh, here is a sentence describing what Google's homepage should look like with GPT-3 generating the code. And then there are like several of these examples out there where people actually stumble upon emergent capabilities um, of models. So basically all this Twitter evaluation is complementing the quantitative benchmarks and often points to us a number of interesting you know, insights um, about these models. So I think this is the last slide and uh, I'd like to, to leave you with a question that, um, yeah, quantitative benchmarks are needed and are important, but uh, perhaps we might be in need for a new usage-based evaluation framework for this new um, new generation of models. And that's it. <laughs>